Well, welcome everyone to the AOCS student e-poster pitch competition for the processing division. Uh, we are looking forward to some great student presentations today, uh, hearing the feedback and questions from our judges and seeing participation from the live audience. We will be working in uh, questions from the audience and you also will have a role in voting for the best pitch. Uh, I wanna begin by introdu introducing our panel of judges. Uh, we have Alan Payne, an officer in the processing division and a consultant based out of the UK. Thank you for being here, Alan. Have uh, Orain Mullings from Desmet Balestra down in Atlanta, who will be, uh, I'm sure, welcoming us to Atlanta. He is uh, for the meeting in May. He has promised good weather and a moderately high pollen count from what I hear. And also uh, Harry Kotopati from uh, USDA uh, ARS, obviously a vital government research partner. Um, so here's what we're gonna do today. Uh, we're going to hear from our student presenters. Uh, they're each going to present for five minutes. After that, we're going to have a seven-minute uh, Q&A session. We'll get some feedback from the judges. I'll be monitoring the questions coming in on uh, the Google platform and work those in from my side. Uh, once we finish the presentations, uh, we're going to pause for a little bit to let the judges confer and vote. Uh, we'll also be bringing in the audience input. Uh, as that has a role in uh, determining who wins today. And at the end, we'll, we'll announce our runner up and our first place winner. Um, there are some great prizes here uh, and, and recognition for the students that work hard during these presentations. Uh, so with that, uh, we're gonna wish the students luck, uh, thank our judges once again for participating and move in. So our first presenter today is Eda Kaya from the Food Science Institute and Department of Animal Sciences and Industry at Kansas State University. Uh, Edda is a PhD student and graduate research student in the food science uh, department, as mentioned. She's working on a PhD project. Um, hang on just a sec here, sorry for that. I switched to my computer and lost my spot. She's working on her PhD, uh, which is focused on the characterization and development of sorghum DDGS for value-added food applications. This is funded by the Global Food System Seed Grant Program and supported by the United States Department of Agriculture. She is working with Assistant Professor Dr. Umut Yusel. Uh, Edda obtained her bachelor's and master's degrees in engineering from the Department of Food Engineering, Middle East Technical University in Ankara, Turkey in July 2017 and September 2019, respectively. She's had a professional work experience with Unilever in their supply chain department as a strategic demand planner between 2017 and 18. Her master's thesis and published article was related to chia seeds and formulation and characterization of high pressure process nanoemulsion systems. She started her PhD in, at the Food Science Institute of Animal Science and Industry in January of 2020. Her research interests focuses on the sustainable and biodegradable food application. In addition to this, she has also included a few side projects, which focused on the use of acetyl triacylglyceride from transgenic camelina sativa as a novel plasticizer and stabilizer in different food applications. Today, she'll be presenting on the effect of high oleic acetyl triacylglycerol on the functional properties of biodegradable sorghum DDGS packaging film. Take it away. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, hi everyone, this is Eda. Today I will be introducing my poster. Uh, but first I would like to start with the outline. Today I will be talking about the background information, my research problem, results, and conclude with the relevance of that study. So what is acetyl TAG that you can see in the title of my poster? As you can see on the left side, Camelina sativa, Arabidopsis, and soybean, they are transgenic host plants, but today I will be focusing on Camelina sativa. It can transgenically be engineered using inanimous allato C acetylglycerol acetyl transferase enzyme to produce acetate group at essentially position, which is acetyl TAG. 
So this modified structure brings value added physical chemical characteristics to this acetyl TAG. So it can be used as a food stabilizer, emulsifier, or plasticizer in the different packaging film applications. So what is the relation with the biodegradable packaging films? As you already know, biodegradable packaging films have been popular due to green site and sustainable issues in recent years. So sorghum, which is the fifth commonly grown crop in the world and fifth in the United States, is actually characteristic properties with the maize. However, it has high draft tolerance and quick adaptability to environment. So sorghum and sorghum DDGS can be used as a renewable material for packaging film applications. So what about DDGS? DDGS or distiller's dried grain with solubles are the remaining portions of grain during ethanol production. And according to the studies, DDGS is actually the five-fold high nutritional form of the uh, traditional grains that we know. So DDGS can be potential materials for packaging applications. So what was our research problems? We can divide it into two different aspects. The first one was finding an alternative use area for a DDGS instead of animal feed or fuel production. If you find a suitable preconditioning and treatment methods, DDGS can be used as a renewable packaging material. And the second part of the research problem was, how can we improve the uh, physical chemical and mechanical characteristics of these sorghum DDGS fields? Here, acetyl TAG is coming to act as a novel plasticizer. So the hypothesis of that study for sorghum DDGS films can successfully be generated if we are using the proper pretreatment and acetyl TAG can serve as an effective plasticizer. Here you can see the experimental steps and materials that I use through my research. And here you can see different types of experiment to characterize the sorghum DDGS packaging fields. So the, one of the results for biodegradability of the films, and uh, we saw that sorghum DDGS films has started to degradate after two weeks and completely degraded after eight weeks. They actually preserve their rigidity, especially for the first two weeks. Also, fatty acid characterization of acetyl TAG was performed using TLC and LCMS. And FTIR was also applied to see the interaction between acetyl TAG and different polymeric structures found in the sorghum DDGS. Oxygen permeability was an important tool for a packaging film. Surprisingly, addition of 0.2% acetyl TAG significantly reduced the diffusion coefficient and improved the oxygen permeability of our films. Also, you can see the microscopic images. Acetyl TAG visually improved the structural integrity of our films. Moisture solubility was another important parameter. Addition of acetyl TAG in 0.1 and 0.2% significantly reduced the moisture solubility of films. They also have a positive effect on the mechanical aspects of the films. Elongation of these films has increased fivefold with the addition of 0.2% acetyl TAG. So the relevance of that study was sorghum DDGS can be used as a biodegradable, sustainable packaging material, and acetyl TAG can serve as a potential plasticizer to improve the mechanical, physical properties of films. So these were the references that I used through my research. Thanks for your attention. Oh, thank you for that presentation. 
great one to start us off. I really like the, I uh, found the images with the biodegradation fascinating, really kind of demonstrated the type of uh, performance you have there. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to people a lot more intelligent than I am to engage you in some questions. Uh, so with that, gentlemen, please take it away. I'm not, I'm not sure about that, Mike. But, um, <laughs> can I, can, if I if I can start, um, you, you've got this, um, this sort of grain residue uh, the, mm -hmm. this, 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 this grain has been used for making various things. Now, after you made it into the packaging film, is there still some residue from that which can still be used for animal feed or something else? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, we got this residue from a uh, company in Kansas, USA, which is uh, currently using the sorghum and the EDGS as an animal feed and for breweries and distilleries and ethanol production facilities. But they are they actually produce a lot of DDGS and the same DDGS can be used as a packaging material. But for that, we use a uh, colloid meal and UD meal to um, actually reduce the particle size to make it much more solubilized in the film formulation. And it was in the powder form, and we actually mixed some acetyl triacylglycerols and some other uh, glycerol and a uh, very rare amount of locust bean gum uh, to obtain that film structure. And for that, ethanol and water was also used as a solvent. Yeah. yeah. So you're using virtually all of the stuff, the uh, yes. DDGA, that, yeah. that, that's all being, because it's not like you're separating something no. from it you're using the whole thing basically. Yeah, exactly. We are using the whole DDGS, uh, but it actually has some complex structure because of the protein and the starch and the fibers and everything. So to make it much more homogenized and, uh, in a film structure, we need to use some solvents and the acetyl triacylglycerol with that. I'll just to say one more thing before I hand over to my colleagues. See, uh, I, I noticed that you said you could uh, it would degrade in around eight weeks. Now um, I'm just worried that might be a little too soon. I mean, I've taken some of the so-called biodegradable packaging that I get various things in these days, put it on the compost heap with a load of grass, and then you dig it up six months later, and it it's still there. You know, yeah. is, is there a danger that? You know, you know, compared with other types of biodegradable film, are you sort of more biodegradable, you know, about average or or less mm -hmm. biodegradable? Yeah, um, I actually compared it with the other uh, polymer based plant protein polymer based packaging films. And generally the biodegradability is between eight to 10 weeks for them too. So it was, um, kind of a better to moderate level, the biodegradability of the DDGS film itself. Uh, for my research, I actually extended the time to really see complete degradation, uh, which was more than eight week, which was almost 10 week, which is actually the similar with the other plant-based films. Okay, yeah, maybe I'm just not doing the composting right. No, just, yeah. uh... <laughs> Okay, th thanks. thanks so much. I'll, I'll see what my, my colleagues have got to, uh, to say as well. Okay. That's a fantastic presentation, Edda. I really liked uh, your use of graphics as well and the way it all flew well together. Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned um, that the material started breaking down at around two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, is there any, were there any special conditions that the material was subject to to cause this breakdown? Um, no, actually um the soil the type of the soil that we were using wasn't a smooth one it has a the soil that we actually collected from the food science garden in k-state so it was actually full of um you know live organisms and the other kind of like small rocks and everything and i was thinking it really uh, kind of helped to to actually fast uh degradation of the films itself uh, but there wasn't any specific um, thing to just like fasten the degradation. It was kind of surprising for us to see that fast uh, degradation in a natural soil that we can get in the garden. Excellent. And um, with that degradation in the soil, um, were there any further studies done on kind of 
and I guess a degradation in a little bit of a controlled environment, like um, maybe a shelf that was placed on or anything like that? No, for the sorghum or sorghum DDGs, uh, there is no study going on to study for the degradation. So always my reference point is another types of plant-based uh, or byproduct-based uh, packaging films to compare the degradation. Great, thank you very much. Harry, thank if you. you have anything. Yeah, nice presentation, Edda. Um, thank you. So you just take the acetyl tag and mix it up with it and test it, like how does it work? Like what's the physical state of your tag? And how much tag do you usually use? The acetyl TAG that you were asking? Yeah. Uh, we use 0.1 to 0.2% weight bases based on the overall film formulation. Uh, we use the high lake transgenic lines. There is actually two different types of acetyl TAG lines, but we prefer to use the high lake ones uh, because it was the, the most abundant one and kind of an affordable one. So we use 0.1 to 0.2% uh, in the film formulation. We directly actually introduce it uh, to the solvent environment that we're going to mix the film ingredients. So everything actually mixed up at the same time before casting of the films. Excellent. Well, thank you for the questions, judges. That brings us to the end of our Q&A period. Uh, so once again, thank you for leading us off with a great presentation, Edna, and we will be back with our second poster pitch. Okay, it is time for our second e-poster pitch. I am pleased to introduce Aleli de Jesus Hernandez. She is a PhD student at the Centro de Investigación en Biotecnología Aplicada from the Instituto Politécnico Nacional in Mexico. She is doing research about vegetable oils, uh, specifically bleaching of vegetable oils using high ultrasound. Her interest areas fall between food, biotechnology, chemistry, emergent technologies, and overall chemistry of vegetable oils. Alali, take it away. Okay, thank you so much for this introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, my name is Alali de Jesus, I'm from Mexico. I'm currently, I'm a student my PhD at Instituto Politecnico Nacional. And this time I'm going to present my project title, the effect of the high intensity ultrasound on canola bleaching on Brazilian canapus L. And I will start by mentioning that Mexico is one of the main consumer of fried products for that reason needs high amount of vegetable oils. These kind of products are extracted from fruit or oil seeds and commonly enriching beneficial fatty acids to the head of the consumer. 
Despite Mexico has an extensive red to oil seed, one of the most used in the industry is canola, specifically Brassica napus L, because it's rich in unsaturated fatty acid, like linolenic in 9%, and linoleic in 26%. Besides, it's rich in oleic acid in 61%. But uh, to keep this kind of characteristic in a secondary product like a oil and make them more accessible to the consumer, a refining process is necessary. But sometimes this kind of process could change the principal configuration to the final product. Currently in Mexico, the methodology most used to carry out this kind of process is a 180 minutes procedure in combination with 3% of bleaching clay and 140 Celsius. Despite is the most used methodology in the industry has some disadvantages. The first one is the use of high temperature which could change the seed configuration from the unsaturated fatty acid to trans configuration to strongly beneficial properties to the final product. And the second one is the use of high amount of bleaching clay which could contaminate soil and water when this is discarded. For that reason, the industry and the academy are looking for new techniques to bleaching vegetable oil and some research show that the high intensity ultrasound will be very useful. Due to this, the main of this project is develop a bleaching procedure to the canola oil using high intensity ultrasound to reduce the disadvantages that the conventional method has. Okay, regarding to material and methods to this project, six ultrasound system was developing using two time process, 60 and 90 minutes in combination with one, two and 3% of bleaching clay and 60 Celsius. All of them were processing and 600 watts for a kilohertz and 100% of amplitude. On the other hand, a conventional method was developed and was called light control method. And to know the effectiveness about this um, bleaching system was determined the content of pigments, chlorophyll and carotenoids, was measured the color taking the values to the luminosity and the uh, chromatic coordinates and finally, an spectroscopy analysis was developed used the mic infrared. And with the result obtained, we could see the following information. The ultrasound treatment reduced more percentage that uh, recompose than the conventional method, specifically the treatment that used um, the two time process in combination with 2% of the chin clay, almost reduced the 90%. But in the content of carotenoids happened the opposite. The conventional method reduced more percentage of these uh, pigments, almost reduced the clear percent. And this is the ratio we could observe in the measure of color two, because when we compare the ultrasound examples when the conventional examples, the difference between them is very low. And this happened numeral numerically and visually. Finally, with, this, with the spectroscopy analysis, we could observe that the spectral behavior is very, very similar in all of the treatments. That means that the ultrasound system uh, doesn't change any configuration to the final product. Besides, we could observe eight representative peaks in all other treatments, but we focus specifically in two and 720 and the 3005 uh, weight number. The first one represents the cis configuration and the second one and the second one represents the double bump. None of the ultrasound treatments changes. And it's important to say that the none of the ultrasound system encourages the appearance to trans configuration because we couldn't see any representative peak and 960 or a 3040 uh, weight number. Due to this, we can conclude that the high intensity ultrasound is a good way to uh, bleaching vegetable oil because it reduces a lot of pigments and doesn't use high temperatures or high uh, amount of bleaching clay. Uh, besides, doesn't change the principal configuration to the final product like the, spe the spectroscopy analysis show us. That's all for my part. Thank you so much for your attention and I open to answer any question. Well, thank you for that presentation. That's the first I've come across uh, the use of ultrasound and bleaching. So been around the industry for a bit, but there's something always new. So uh, thank you for that.
Uh, we have some very experienced processing folks on our judging panel. So I'm going to turn that over to, uh, to Alan, O'Rain, and Harry. You want to start, O'Rain? You got you said very experienced. I hear you go for it, Alan. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, um, do you first of all, you mentioned 600 watts that you were using. How much oil was that working on? You know, what quantity of oil was the 600 watts affecting? Uh, yes, uh, we choose these parameters to indicate the examples because in other uh, works that we made, uh, we we can see that the the energy that um, um, uh, allow in the example is important to make uh, a specific changes in the example because if you uh, use uh, uh, a, a low energy, the change that we we want to to see in the oils doesn't happen. So it's important re regular the watts, the energy, mm -hmm. and the intensity uh, in the wave. So uh, for bibliography, for other uh, papers, and um, for the other work that we we made, we can see that uh, these conditions are the 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 better to the to the treatment. No, so is it, but how much oil did you, you got? Six hundred watts. But what was the quantity of oil that you were processing in this in this trial? Okay, uh, the equipment we use a batch uh, ultrasound, and the the the, the equipment uh, give us this condition. We we regulate to the six hundred or maybe uh, four hundred watts, but we use the 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 top on the energy, and we can regulate the the amplitude to the wave too in the in the equipment okay well I'm, I'm still not quite sure anyway i'll just move on here um i wouldn't normally expect trans to be formed much during bleaching anyway um you know, my in my ex you'd normally get bleached oil about 0.1 0.2 trans um i also find that the the temperate the conditions what you uh, what you said is conventional bleaching is quite high 140 c 180 minutes three percent bleaching it's all very extreme conditions uh is this because you know the is the quality of of oil that's reaching mexico very poor to you, you these are fantastically extreme conditions yes uh, the conventional method uh just use uh, these parameters uh, three, the top of the, the amount of bleaching, a high temperature and a long time process. But in this process, um, the high temperature could change the seed configuration in the unsaturated fatty acid. So we want to avoid that this happen. For that reason, we use another uh, time and, and we use another uh, temperature that is one of the principal parameters to keep the beneficial properties in the final product. Okay, I'll, I'll hand over to the others. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, to touch a little bit uh, on uh, Alan's question as well. I'm wondering where did you, uh, I guess, where the basis for the typical conditions come from, from the industry? Um, can you repeat that please? Because- uh, uh, Yes, yeah, certainly. How did you determine the 3% bleaching earth, 145 bleaching temperature as a standard condition to compare your your test methods against. Okay, uh, the conventional uh, parameter, uh, I, I searched in the industry and I read about it. So uh, take the base, these parameters, we could change the extremely uh, parameters. So we could try with uh, a less temperature and we choose like a medium and a low temperature. Due to this, uh, I work with 90 and 60 minutes. And when the bleach, um, um, the bleaching clay, uh, we try with the top of the, the bleaching clay that use the industry. And we want to know if, we, if using uh, less uh, bleaching clay, almost 2% or 1%, has the the same results or a similar results in the final product so we we can play with the parameters so uh we we see the results for example in the content of pigments uh, we could observe that the that using a less temperature and using a a, a less 
uh, a low bleaching clay, we could uh, like uh, equal the the product that normally uh, is uh, sold in the industry. Okay. Um, as well, um, were your test methods, I see you mentioned chlorophyll in the outgoing process. Were your uh, test methods uh, effective at reducing chlorophyll as well? Yes. Uh, well, to know the effectiveness to this uh, system, the bleaching system, uh, uh, we know that the chlorophyll is most important because uh, they have a color in the final product. So we want to, to know how to affect them, the, the temperature affect them, and this affects the color. So uh, there are two the principal parameters that we want to measure. So um, we use a, a spectros, uh, no, no, um, um, well, well uh, uh, you uh, you be visible the visible part, and we we can measure this this part to the how is the reduction of the chlorophylls and carotenoids. In this case, um, the canola oil has so much carotenoids. So we want to know how to affect the temperature and in combination with the ultrasound to equal with the conventional method. Okay. I think I just have one more question, um, touching a little bit on what Alan said in the first point. And, and I forgot to mention as well, I really enjoyed the topic that you selected. It was very, uh, very novel application. Um, have there been thoughts on two additional um, future steps to improve maybe the quantity of oil process? and a feasible way of scaling up the, the your experiment? Yeah. Uh, well, I think uh, that it's possible because, because in the laboratory, the, the results are very favorable. And I am really hope that in a few years, uh, there are um, an industry that make uh, some equipment that uh, with similar characteristics to the ultrasound, like in the laboratory. Well, I think that it's happened, it's possible. Thank you. We we are at time, but Harry, I wanted to see if you had a quick question that you wanted to put in. No, you're okay? No, not at the moment. You can go ahead. Okay. Perfect. Nice presentation. Well, yeah, excellent. And congrats on your, uh, I heard this was your first presentation. You did an outstanding job. And thank, thank you, you so Alan much. and O'Ray, for your questions. Uh, with that, we will take a quick break and be back with presenter number three. Okay, I am pleased to introduce our third student for their e-poster pitch. We have Olamide Fedairo, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of Food and Human Nutritional Sciences, the Richardson Center for Food Technology and Research at the University of Manitoba, Winnipeg, up in Canada. Olamide holds bachelor's degrees with first class honors in food technology from the University of Ibadan in Nigeria and a master's degree in food safety and quality engineering with distinction from the University of Debrecen in Hungary. His doctoral research focuses on the green pretreatment and extraction, quantification, and isolation of phenolic compounds and minor constituents from mustard and canola co-products. By extension, he elucidates on the impacts of innovative green processing technologies on the phenolic profile and other minor components of oil seeds, mainly mustard, canola, and their associated byproducts. He currently has three publications in peer-reviewed journals, and today he will present on the efficacy of air frying as a hot air pretreatment technique in enhancing the yield of the major oil-derived synaptic acid derivatives from canola oil. Olamide, take it away. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'll just go straight to the presentation. 
uh, entitled Efficacy of Air Frying as a Hot Air Pretreatment, Enhancing the Yield of the, the Major Oil Synapic Acid Derivatives uh, from Canola Oil. Uh, why canola and why the need to continually improve uh, byproduct utilization as well as the uh, uh, consumer end use is that canola constitute the major crop in Canada as a major source of revenue. And uh, canola is the Canada is the first or is the, is the major producer of canola uh, globally. And uh, canola is quite rich in uh, valuable nutritional compounds as well as uh, functional ingredients. And that makes it uh, a good choice for the extraction of this uh, useful health promoting constituents. And based on the fact that uh, there are concerns regarding the uh, safety of uh, synthetic uh, antioxidants, such as the butylated hydroxytoluene uh, and the BHT in food system, and the continuous search for natural antioxidants in food, uh, cosmetics, and uh, pharmaceutical industry application. And roasting has been used in previous studies and documented to be effective as a way of improving the extraction and recovery of this uh, major synapates or synapic acid derivatives from the uh, oysters, particularly mustard and uh, canola. But uh, what is new is that uh, hair frying has not been used, but that would be my first study on, can uh, on mustard, which was published last year on the efficacy of this uh, air frying treatment as a roasting technique. So by extension, and it was applied on canola because those are my major focus when it comes to oil seeds processing. And the methodology involves the following. Uh, roasting uh, 15 grams of sample, I mean canola seed, uh, at different temperature time combination of 160, 170, 180, and 190 for 5, 10, 15, and 20 minutes respectively. And the following unit operations were conducted on the resultant extract to get in or extracting the phenolic antioxidants, mainly canola, which is the main focus. And by extension, screening them, I mean, the extracts from this canola oil, screening them for antioxidant activity using the radical DPPH radical scavenging, uh, say the FRAB, the ferric reducer antioxidant power, as well as the chelation of the metal ion. And the results was quite promising in the sense that as the, there was a progressive increase in the concentration of this canola as the air frying time and temperature increased. And the optimal condition was 190, 15 minutes to extract the major oil soluble synaptic acid derivative, which is the, which is the canola. And the synapine showed a reverse uh, outcome as the temperature increases, it actually decreases. And this actually shows the interrelationship between the conversion of uh, synapine to synaptic acid, then the canola is a two-stage decarboxylation reaction. And if you look at the synapine here, the, I mean, the synaptic acid also decreases over time and temperature. And it, uh, consequent to that, there were some unidentified compounds that were actually detected in the extract and further studies will be conducted on these unknown compounds to actually know what uh, makeup in terms of the phenolic profile. And the results of antioxidant assay also show that uh, the meta ion chelation property was also in interesting in terms of the temperature time combination treatment on the uh, canola oil extract. And the, DPP, the DPPH radical scavenging activity also increases as the time temperature of the air frying increases. And the ferric uh, reducing antioxidant power also showed that the optimum condition 
was 190, 15, and 20 minutes. And when you compare that with the, the popular butylated hydroxytoline, which is the synthetic antioxidant, it was far greater. I mean, the ferry reducing antioxidant power was far greater than the different concentration of this uh, synthetic antioxidant of 0.05 milligram per mil, 5.5 and 0.25, meaning that uh, we, the ice put. We are at time, Alami Day, so if you could wrap up, please. So meaning that uh, the, the, the extra show promising result in terms of their application in food feed and pharmaceutical industry. Uh, that's my conclusion. Efrain pretreatment is a novel and effective pretreatment operation that can be used to enhance the recovery of this uh, important compound. And the antioxidant activity of this extract actually show promising results. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. All right, well, thank you for that presentation. Makes me think how different the front end of a uh, oil mill could look if we get away from things like stack cookers and everything else. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to the gentleman on the judging panel for some questions for you, Olamide. Uh, but thank you again for a great presentation. Well, thanks so much, Olamide. Um, uh, I see you're, you're being following up this subject for, for some time now, but... Um, it's good to see a firm conclusion, but uh, you, you say 190, minute, 190 degrees Celsius and 15 minutes, but these were more or less at the extreme end of, of the conditions that you used. Uh, uh, was there no possibility to go higher in temperature? What if you went to 200 degrees or 210? Does that actually start to cause things to deteriorate or does the equipment you're using not allow you to go any higher? Actually, the equipment, I'm just trying to balance the industry perspective to that because, you know, higher temperature, more time will mean more cost in terms of energy. And uh, with respect to that, uh, it is also in progress, like I said earlier, because why that was, uh, was uh, conducted on my previous research on mustard, the optimum condition was actually 170, 15 minutes even though both of them belong to the same brassical family. So it's an ongoing research, but for now, the optimum condition for canola is actually 119, 15 minutes. However, there was also considerable increase in the recovery of this uh, canola at 180 for 15 minutes, meaning that uh, that could actually mean the sweet spots would be around that temperature time regime. And if you're doing this, if you're doing this in industry, would you um, uh, do do this on the seed before you extracted the? Is this a, something you do on the oil, or is it on the seed? On the seed. Yeah. So you're 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 roasting the seed and then you're extracting the canolol. Yes, from the oil. Oh, from the oil afterwards. So you'd go through the whole normal process and then you extract the canolol from the oil afterwards. Yes, and from the meal. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, presentation, Alameda. I really enjoyed uh, your introduction, kind of giving a uh, good explanation financially why this could be important to processors, especially in Canada. Um, looking at uh, some of the results that you have, is there any sort of control slash industrial environment that these results could be compared to? Uh, in terms of what you, you what you meant by control in terms of work? I suppose I'm kind of getting to you've gone with air frying versus we have more conventional methods like stacked cookers. So I'm I'm not sure personally why an air fryer versus a stacked cooker. What difference that makes if there's the seed itself is seeing the same process conditions, and um, kind of like what, if there was a control that this was done against, like a base case. Yes, uh, we've actually done with uh, conventional oven. 
So which the result was quite uh, lower in terms of the recovery of Hanu law. I mean, the compound of interest. So that's why we uh, conducted same research on EFRA because, you know, EFRA is uh, easy to get, quite affordable. And uh, we're looking at the possibility of using that to, uh, should I say, overturn, so to speak, or as an alternative to using conventional oven. And we've actually done that too on microwave oven as well. And the results is actually amazing as well. So that's yeah. why we're trying to look at the possibilities. I see. And you found that uh, the air fryer is uh, uh, more promising than something like a conventional oven that would be more comparable to the current industrial setting. Yes, on a case by case basis, though. Thank you. Oh, oh Rain, in practice, would that be something like a fluid bed heater? That's what I'm trying to like air dryer? That's what I'm thinking, because it seems like you're introducing a lot more air. To... Yes, because you know the Brownian motion-like movement actually helps to you know uh, increase the surface uh, area to contact. So that makes it um, uh, arguably that may be responsible for the increased yield of all these uh, targeted compounds. I wondered if like a rotary drum dryer with a strong airflow going through it would um, have the same effect. You know, the sort mm -hmm. of thing that goes around like a cement kiln or something like that. You may be, maybe see those in some some mills. Yeah, it could. It'd be very interesting to see uh, kind of an industrial comparison to see what this would most likely look like for an industrial equipment, I think. Thank you. I have one question. Uh, it's a nice presentation uh, following up on your previous research. Uh, so you mentioned about extraction efficiencies compared to your previous research on mustard seeds, right? Yes. So, so uh, I know the you know the, the methods you're using. You know you're trying to um, uh, uh, extract you know, canola oil, but what's happening to oil? Like you know, you're you're. Do you look at the oil composition at all, or I'm just curious. Yeah, to because know what, what happens? Yeah, because uh, it's a. Uh... It's a cluster project, so with different uh, investigators. So uh, my part is the antioxidant uh, uh, extraction or phenolic compound extraction. So the, uh, the team of researchers are actually doing, I think from AFC, they're actually doing that part of uh, uh, oil profile in terms of uh, the effect on the, the free fatty acid, effect on the, maybe the trans fat or cis fat, then the protein as well. Because you know, when you extract, you separate the meal from the oil. So the meal fraction as well is actually being investigated as well. Then coupled with the uh, in terms of uh, amino acid profile, what happens to you know the composition of this uh, you know uh, nutritional composition as well as the functional ingredient aspect of it. So it's a, it's a kind of a cluster project with individual aspects to work on. Thank you. Excellent. And I'm not seeing any questions from the chat. We are right at time. So kudos to all involved for seven minutes on the nose. Okay, it is time for our fourth and final e-poster pitch. It's coming to us courtesy of Ra Umesh Rajapaksa, who is a graduate from the Wayamba University of Sri Lanka with a first class honors degree in food science and nutrition, specializing in food science and technology. As a fresh graduate, he has a keen interest in research and product development, 
and wishes to make an impact on the industry through his research findings. He'll speak to us today about utilizing tea industry byproducts to improve instant tea aroma. Right. Uh, thanks a lot for that introduction. Um, if you are familiar with uh, Ceylon tea, I'm pretty sure that you know how we are marketing it uh, according to its geographical origin. And also when it comes to our tea industry, there's a quite a significant percentage of tea that is being wasted as a uh, refuse tea, uh, which the industry calls as a uh, broken mixed panage. Now, uh, in Sri Lanka, now we are using that uh, wastage to uh, produce instant tea, which is a soluble form of the tea extract, uh, which comes as a powder. So the thing is, this instant tea, we can't market it uh, the way that we are doing for black tea because it doesn't smell as good and you can't uh, perceive those differences you can see in black tea. So what we wanted to find out was whether there are quality variations in the aroma in that uh, refused uh, portion of uh, black tea and whether we can uh, take aroma extracts from that wastage and uh, incorporate into the uh, production process of instant tea to improve the quality of uh, instant tea and mimic those variations you see in black tea. So the way we went about doing this was first uh, we collected samples, uh, BMF grade uh, leaf tea samples from the three growing elevations in uh, Sri Lanka. That's uh, high grown, mid grown and low grown. And we produced instant tea from them. And also we made a special sample, which is known as the aroma blended instant tea sample. Uh, the process was this, uh, almost the same with one exception where we uh, uh, trapped the, uh, uh, the steam, which con contains those uh, volatile aroma compounds and we condensed it. And we added that back to that uh, concentrated tea liquor just before spray drying to produce that uh, aroma blended instant tea sample. So the samples that we made, as well as their respective raw materials, we uh, tested for their volatile profiles, as well as uh, two other chemical parameters, which are uh, quite important in the in instant tea industry. Uh, those are total polyphenolic content, as well as the haste uh, or the turbidity of the infusion. And our results showed that uh, uh, in the high grown tea, um, there's a significantly high amount of polyphenols as well as the turbidity of the infusion was also significantly high. And uh, there was a linear correlation between these two parameters. And the qualitative analysis of the aroma profiles showed that there in fact is a, a variation between the three growing elevations where the estates from uh, these different uh, elevations had uh, detected some unique compounds in the GCMS al analysis, uh, which were not there in the other uh, growing elevations. And coming to our focus uh, of the study, which is the aroma blended sample, uh, it was interesting to see that uh, now when we made this sample, we took uh, Nuorelia BMF as the starting material uh, because Nuorelia is the most popular estate uh, in the high grown region. So we took that. And uh, when you consider the BMF, there, there are uh, a lot of aroma compounds which were absent in the uh, instant tea we produced from it. But those compounds again appeared in that aroma blended sample showing uh, that there in fact is a change in uh, with the aroma profile, with the geographical origin and also that we can actually use that aroma extract from this uh, refuse tea portion uh, in order to mimic changes that are there in the, um, uh, the different kinds of tea. And also when you consider the polyphenol content, uh, when you go through the literature, we've found that uh, due to these uh, tough conditions that are there in the high grown region, it could possibly stimulate the plant to produce more of these poly, uh, phenolic and bioactive compounds. And also because of the complexation of uh, these uh, compounds, this uh, turbidity is uh, resulted. So that is why there is a linear correlation between those two. So in conclusion, uh, we, found that we can actually uh, mimic those changes uh, in the aroma profiles 
according to the geographical origin by using the aroma condensate from uh, the BMF portion. And also when you consider uh, this uh, TPC content as well as the haze, uh, for therapeutic applications uh, like um, small pills, uh, you can use high grown tea and uh, for uh, ready to drink beverages where you need a clear infusion uh, for consumer peel, uh, you can go with either mid or low grown tea. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. I hadn't wasn't aware of that category with instant tea beverages. So appreciated the, the link between that and, and the science behind them. Uh, I will turn it over to the judges. Gentlemen, take it away. Thanks so much for that uh, interesting presentation. Um, here in England, this is where I am at the moment. Of course, the tea drinking is, is legendary. Uh, and we've all heard of Ceylon tea here. But um, did you do any sort of comparison between the 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 quality of the uh, the the um, instant tea that you produced uh, with what you might think of as a proper cup of um, uh, of Ceylon tea made from leaves in the traditional way? Um, yes, there was a separate study that we did where we uh, compared different other grades like uh, Broken Orange uh, uh, BOPF and OP grade, so, uh, grades like that with uh, the instant tea. And uh, there were comparable uh, results, but uh, the polyphenol content especially was much higher in uh, instant tea than uh, tea, uh, a cup of tea from any of those uh, high grades. And, uh, but of course, uh, when you consider the perceived aroma in uh, sensory analysis, uh, the normal cup was much better than the instant tea, hence the reason to do this study uh, to improve that aroma. Yeah, well, you see, it doesn't surprise me that uh, the instant tea can't quite come up to the standard of a normal cup of tea, but you, know, but certainly you feel you've made a great improvement. Yes, of course. Hmm. And how did you actually separate out the, uh, uh, these volatile components condensing at a different temperature? So when you've got all the steam coming off the concentrate, are you, uh, how are you separating out the, uh, the aromas from the water? Um, actually, at this stage, uh, we just took the condensed steam. So we ran, ran through a condenser running a room temperature bought at 25 degrees Celsius. But uh, in future studies, we are hoping to uh, utilize a reverse osmosis process in order to uh, concentrate it and uh, uh, use it, use the same uh, BMF sample for uh, multiple applications. Oh, so, so you just condensed the whole thing? Yes. Oh, but then how did you put back the concentrated aroma? Uh, we uh, calculated the total dry solid content in the, uh, the tea concentrate, that is the tea liquor. Uh, and then uh, we added 30% of that dry solid content in, uh, from that uh, aroma condensate. So about uh, six milliliters per hundred milli, uh, six milliliters of uh, this aroma condensate to hundred milliliters of the tea liquor. Oh, so you just put back a small percentage of the whole, the whole, um condensate yes it oh, uh, made, yeah it made an improvement but uh, we can improve it further by uh, uh, like how you said uh, by uh, separating those uh, compounds by, by reverse osmosis yes that's what oh, we're okay. looking yeah good Yes, uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Numesh. I, again, I really like the way that you were able to show the use case for this and why something like this is important for the industry. Um, kind of on, on, on that note, well, I guess on a separate note, um, what, 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 what methods did you take to ensure that there was proper controls over the, the different teas grown at the different elevation? Like, are these different 
uh, types of tea grown in these different elevations? Uh, no, actually, we uh, took samples from estates that are managed by the same plantation company. So uh, most of the variables were uh, between the elevations were um, uh, minimized. For example, uh, their pruning cycles and the way they apply fertilize, and also their pr uh, processing uh, methods, the, the orthodox uh, processing methods are almost the same. So that way we try to minimize as much variables as possible. That's, that's good to hear. Yeah. That's good to hear. I think maybe a little bit tangentially related. So maybe this might not be something that you uh, would fully look at while you're evaluating the scope you are, but is there, uh, you probably know better than me, a big push to have these, this, this more aromatic flavor in these, um, Instant teas, is that something industrially they would find a, a good uh, economic uh, fashion behind? Yeah, economically, uh, I think, of course, it will increase the cost of the product. But uh, when you compare with the quality of the final product, I think it's a valuable proposition uh, to uh, chase after. And uh, like Alan said, uh, there's definitely a difference between the instant tea as well as a normal cup of tea. So what we're trying to do is give the convenience as well as the quality. Thank you. Yeah, nice, nice presentation, Amesh. Uh, I have one follow-up question to Orain's first question. Um, so you mentioned that you're trying to minimize the variables between the, you know, the, you know, the, the, uh, the cultivation of teas at the high ground and a normal tea, right? So, yeah. so what's the difference between high grown and 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 the other, you know, the the, the normal uh, grown tea? Like, what's the elevation difference? Uh, so, less uh, if the the estate uh, is at an elevation of uh, less than three hundred uh, meters from uh, average sea level, we consider that as low. And between 300 to uh, 600, we consider that as uh, we considered that as uh, mid, and above 600 meters, we considered those as uh, high grown elevations. So uh, there is no uh, major environmental uh, variations like humidity or or oxygen or anything, right? Um, there, there are actually uh, like. Uh, when it comes to the high ground elevation, of course, the temperatures are much less, uh, like uh, 14 degrees compared to uh, low ground elevation where the mean temperature is about uh, 25 to 30 degrees Celsius. So there are uh, uh, changes that are uh, imposed by those climatic conditions. And uh, we think that the changes we observe are because of those, uh, because of the impact of the different climatic conditions of these uh, growing elevations. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank nice you. presentation. Good job. Well, work. Well, I'm going to check one last time into the uh, online doc. Doesn't look like we have any questions from the audience. So I think that will uh, conclude uh, the Q&A session for our fourth presenter. Thank you again, Umesh. Um, and thank you to everyone who attended. We are now going to uh, go into our deliberations and judging period. Um, this includes the launch of the audience poll. Uh, that's gonna occur on the AOCS annual meeting website. Uh, instructions for how to access that will be posted in the chat by our uh, remarkable AOCS staff who is moderating and implementing this whole process here. Uh, the audience vote is important. It actually plays a role in the placement of our top finishers. And we encourage all of you to think back on the four presentations and vote for your favorite pitch. Uh, we will see you all in a few minutes to announce the winners of the Processing Division e-poster pitch.
All right. Well, welcome back. The scores are in. We've looked at the judges' tallies. We've looked at the audience input. And I've been told it was an extremely close uh, decision. Uh, there are some great prizes for our students today. Uh, first place winner is going to receive a $200 cash prize, a certificate of recognition, and a student membership for 2023 in the AOCS. Uh, our runner-up will uh, go home with a $100 cash prize, as well as a certificate of recognition from the society. Um, so I am happy to announce our uh, runner-up is Umesh with his presentation on the differences in uh, polyphenolic compounds and teas and their applications. So congrats, Umesh. And our winner today is our first presenter, Eda Kaya. So congratulations, wonderful job all. Um, before we want to, oh, yeah, we'll get a round of applause, not too loud Thank on you. the clock. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Well, I want to thank all of our competition um, participants today. Um, it is never easy to pitch a poster. It's never easy to give a presentation. I don't think that gets any easier when you have to do it on a live stream. Um, so thank you for, for contributing to what I hope is going to be a great uh, AOCS meeting and exhibition this year. Um, I want to thank our judges uh, for their time volunteering today. A uh, huge part of this society is, is people putting in the time. Uh, and lastly, I want to thank the AOCS Foundation who funded this, as well as the uh, members of the AOCS staff that facilitate these meetings and, and make them run smoothly. So with that, enjoy the rest of your days and uh, congrats again to our winners and thank you again to our students for their presentations. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.